that are irrelevant to this class, but um, might be interesting, it was when I was 22, uh, and uh, I left my homeland to work in Canada. And so my first job was, uh, I think I arrived in Vancouver on the West Coast on a, a one-way ticket on a weekend, stayed with some friends, left on a Sunday morning uh, on the Greyhound bus for Calgary, which is about uh, across the, the Rockies on the interior, um, tr basically a 24-hour uh, bus ride. Arrived at 7 o'clock in the morning in Calgary on a Monday morning, uh, left my bag that I had with me by the front door and went to take a leak in the bathroom there. The boss had come in, he took my bag in. I left town that day after buying some warm clothes um, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, bought an alarm clock so I could wake up because I was staying, uh, flew up to Edmonton, woke up at 4 o'clock, caught a flight to uh, Norman Wells, Northwest Territories, which is about uh, just slightly below the Arctic Circle. And so from having started work at 7 o'clock on the Monday morning, at 8 o'clock on the Tuesday morning, I was standing on three feet of river ice on the Mackenzie River on, in charge of a drilling rig, small kind of, not an oil rig, but a drilling rig. So, and it's cold, so it's minus 30. And so that's where I, the one piece of information that I know that's useful in my uh, tool chest is that minus 40 centigrade and minus 40 Fahrenheit are the same thing. So, so, yeah, so that's part of my life story. All right. <laughs> Not that you're interested. Um, so, okay. So, uh, where are we? Uh, so, what we've talked about so far is this idea. This has been our the, the mantra of what we've dealt with so far. And that is that uh, we've tried to understand something about how saturations are controlled maybe by the elevation within the plume where we find ourselves. Um, and we know something about how we can, for instance, calculate what those magnitudes uh, would be. We talked about that at the end of last period. If we can calculate what the capillary pressure is within the, uh, the sequence, either above the water table or below the water table, as in... Um, too many figures here, right? This is really slow, 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 slow. Yeah, this is it, right? Blue, blue. This is where I want to be today, but where we kind of finished off was this idea here, right? If you know what the capillary pressure distribution is within the subsurface, you can say something about how uh, saturations would, would vary. So you get some picture, if you like, of possibly the architecture of what these plumes might look like. And now it makes perfect sense uh, to understand that if you release these fluids, you don't get this uniform plug, but you get this kind of schizophrenic uh, transit through the system where it will go in lots of uh, different uh, areas. Um, if it's a DNAPL in this particular case, I guess we're looking at both before, right? Uh, both DNAPLs and LNAPLs. But if it's in either case, it will tend to go through the uh, profile in a way that's actually governed by the, what you think would be the smallest piece of information. And the smallest piece of information is it's basically seeking out the largest diameter continuous pathway that will take you through there. So something that isn't uh, defining the permeability of it, but it is defining the capillary entry pressure, and entry pressures and um, permeability are actually related because they, they both are controlled by the diameters of the pore spaces. Um, if they're lighter than water, they'll float on the water table and dissolve and be carried down gradient. If they're denser than water, they'll scoot across it. Uh, and depending on the kind of architecture of the reservoir beforehand, um, they will form these uh, ganglia uh, as it goes through it. And the reason for that is that it tends to be able to eat eke out the, um, the smallest, uh, the largest diameter pathway. So here, this is just a bead pack with uh, a non-aqueous fluid in red uh, and water, I think, around it. Uh, the bead pack all of a sudden gets um, uh, fine-grained below this uh, line here. And you can see that this is almost fully saturated because it's been able to invade these large pressures at whatever the capillary pressure is, given by the uh, height of fluid above it. 
but it's only made its way through in a couple of different um, uh, invasion episodes, if you like, in portions where if you mapped out here, you'd probably find that just the arrangements of these glass beads is such that it's, it's finding its way through this uh, uh, portion in a mar relatively marginal way. And so we can define, if we knew the capillary pressure here, you could probably tell me what the capillary diameter of this would be, because they're related in some way, remember? This four times interfacial tension divided by diameter uh, is, is the relationship that relates that. But when we're talking about the behaviors in these systems, uh, actually, I don't think I can do it on the earth. I can't draw on this. But, if you, but that's probably even better. So if you take it from the capillary level and look at these capillary pressure versus saturation curves, which we have, then the average saturations we're talking about are the average over a big block of material. So the block would be like the block that we have here, which is kind of defined in this way. So this would be maybe 40% um, red saturated and 60% uh, blue saturated, which is uh, water and an apple. And so that's the average behavior that we're getting out of here. Although if you looked, for instance, in this portion here of my hand, little hand thing is, then the part in the red, which is there, would be almost 100%, may almost be 100% napple saturation. But when you were talking about capillary pressure curves, we're talking about the average values of this. And so that's kind of uh, where we are uh, so far with, with this. And so we've, we've dealt with capillary behavior based, based on that. And we now know something about the how invasion can happen and why once we get these ganglions, I've closed it, but I guess I should open it again, why when we get these ganglions, they actually have these long um, uh, shapes attached to them. Um, and that is because there's, oh, I didn't mean to do that. And that is because uh, this is trying to go down through this longest highway here. This is basically saying that uh, this length of this ganglion would be happy to keep on migrating so long as it's supplied from the top because it's already reached this critical length. What's stopping it from moving any further than this is the fact that it's, it's reaching a dead end where the pore space is too small for it to be able to transit it at its particular capillary pressure. And so that's why it would arrest. And so it sticks in the ground. Uh, if you had a gradient that would flow things across it from, from your left to your right, then you'd basically... This would be no problem in the ground if it sit like this, but the fact is it dissolves at very low concentrations, at very low rates, and any uh, transit of fluids through the system will carry it downstream <coughs> to some kind of uh, uh, compliance point where you might drink it, which is a, a problem. And so uh, what we've talked about in terms of these are really the mechanisms by which it invades in the first place. And so this is the first step. So we, we have some way of being able to do a couple of things now. We know why it invades. We know what the conditions are when it invades, if we get a ganglion, whether it would stop or not. Uh, we know what the properties are that control that invasion. It's the entry pressure, which scales with the pore diameter, which, as we'll find out, will also scale with the permeability, which is useful. Um, and so we could be able to get some idea of what this equilibrium distribution might be. So we might be able to get a picture of this. What we don't know is how quickly it would get there. We've said nothing about rates at which that can happen, and that's what we'll talk about today. And we've not really said very much about what if we put a straw in here and sucked it out or tried to suck it out, whether we'd be successful or at what rates we'd be able to remove it. And so the, the, the rate at which it goes into a, a porous medium is controlled by kind of a similar process, but slightly, uh, slightly different. And so we'll talk about that today. So I don't know if this has a title. Yeah, it does have a title. So we'll talk about multiphase flow. So the two things we have to satisfy that everywhere in the porous medium, the capillary pressure versus saturation curve has to be true. It is always true. But that only says something about the static behavior. It doesn't say anything about the rates at which it could be flowing. If we looked at, at this, oh, you don't look at that. If we looked at this picture here, then everywhere in this um, vertical section, the capillary pressure should satisfy the saturation if you looked on, on that curve. But in this system, it could also be flowing because we also the other thing that we also said was that away from the boundaries of this distribution, so interfacial tension will work here, but it actually has no, if it's 100% saturated with an apple here, 
interfacial tension is completely irrelevant. It has no control over the system at all. And so, for instance, this stuff could be flowing from your left to your right. The red stuff could be flowing inside the red stuff, not changing the boundaries of this in any way. And that flow would not in any way be governed by interfacial tension. Interfacial tension only governs it if you want to invade some more space and increase the area which, or the volume you're invading with this red fluid. If you're flowing within the confines of this, it's all governed basically by Darcy's law, which is useful because it uh, allows us to return to a concept that you've, uh, you've seen before. And so what we'll do is we'll talk about Darcy's law. So that was our recap. We'll talk about Darcy's law, relative permeabilities, and the permeabilities of uh, fractures. But let me first, I had a change of mind before I came to class today, so let me first work on, on this and say that before we start talking about relative permeabilities, let's talk about capillary models. And I do that just because um, we did it already for uh, looking at invasion processes. We will do it again for looking at flow and fractures. But there's a much simpler way to look at this for something else. I don't want to do that, so I'm going to do this. So this is my new way of doing notes um, on the board. So let's see if it goes this way. So if you want, you can take notes. If you don't, that's fine too. Um, so this is, what do we say, 2, 4? So let's talk about capillary models. So here's the basic idea. basic idea is that we said before that if we look at invasion, we can look at, uh, well, let's look at, so if you look at invasion, then what we could do is we could look at this model that was a, a capillary that's just stuck into water. The water rises up in this to some height, and we can use that to get this expression that is something like, you could probably tell me, but it is uh, the height rise HC0 is going to be proportional to the interfacial tension and the diameter of the tube and I think the unit weight of fluid. And this is the, the, the diameter. And so that's convenient for us because I won't turn it on its side here. Uh, well, actually, it's convenient because what we can do is we can kind of look at porous media as a whole bunch of these capillaries together, which is basically the same as looking at a whole bunch of grains together, where these are the individual grains. Realize it looks a bit like Mickey Mouse. But this poor throat... which has a diameter, which we'll call D, is basically what we're representing here. And so we know that individually we can say something about this capillary behavior. Uh, we can use that to say something about how it, it scales with interfacial tension and uh, inversely with diameter, for instance. Um, and so I guess this is also what? This is PC0 over the unit weight. They're, they're the same things. And so it allows us to say something about the scaling. It allows us to be able to think about why, these, why the behavior that we see in this capillary pressure versus saturation curve looks like the way it is, right? So we, we've drawn this curve many times. And now, hopefully, you can identify all of these important features, PC0, the irreducible saturation of the non-wetting fluid, the irreducible saturation of the wetting fluid. This is uh, 0 and 1 for the saturation of water. So if you don't understand all those terms, then go back to your notes, because those are crucial for what we're doing. This is kind of the crux of what we're doing. So the point I'm trying to make is that this basic capillary model is something that tells us something very simply about what our system is that can be used to understand something which is perhaps much more useful in reality from invasion of a single uh, capillary tube to invasion of the distribution of capillary tubes that we have that make up our medium. And so we can do the same analysis to be able to take, say, flow in a tube like this, 
where we have some volumetric flow rate, and we can use that to say something about uh, Darcy's law. Or permeability. As one of, one of your groups wrote up on this board uh, last time. And so what we could do is we could think of, I'm going to move this down a little bit, uh, what we could do is we could think of a model that looked at a porous medium as a whole bunch of these parallel tubes. And you have flow in each of these tubes, which is individually some magnitude. And we apply across here some change in pressure, we'll call dp. And it occurs over some length of this tube, which we'll call dx. And we can use that information to be able to figure out exactly what Darcy's law is. And again, it's a little bit indulgent of me to do it, but let's do it anyway. Uh, one reason is it, it brings something that we talked about in 303 uh, into a useful, a more useful than otherwise a mode it would be. And so we define Darcy's law. How do we define Darcy's law? Darcy's law is a volumetric flow rate, so it's units of length cubed over time. And if we write it in the petroleum uh, terminology to use permeability rather than hydraulic conductivity, uh, it's a cross-sectional area, a permeability, which is length squared, a fluid viscosity, and a change in pressure that occurs with length. Right? So if you want a quick cameo that shows this, this isn't, uh, yeah, okay, this, this isn't a capri tube, so make that note. But this is something that has some area, it has some length, It has a pressure drop between the upstream P1 and P0. And it has a, a flow that comes out of it. So this make the, make the notation that it's not a cap tube. It's a core. It's a core that has all of these in it. Um, so what we could do is we could try and calculate, if you imagine... <coughs> that we know what the flow in each of these tubes is, and we think of a bundle of them, we could try and calculate what the permeability is in something that looks like this. And so the thing that we're going to draw is a little... It's actually this thing on the top right-hand side. <coughs> I guess what I do is... Um, so it's, so this is, uh, so if you imagine this as being the front face of this, this is our porous medium that we're, we're flying through. And so let's think of our porous medium as a series of these little Capri tubes which exist in the porous medium like a Swiss cheese. But these Capri tubes go all the way through to the back side of this and out. Again, not, not very good drawing. And so what we could do is we could calculate how much the flow would be in each of these uh, tubes. I guess I'm, I know this is going to take much longer than I, I thought it would, but, uh, but that's fine. And so what we need to do is we need to get the flow in one tube. And so you could work that, what that out, work out what that is, or you could go back to never thought I'd be pulling out these notes again, did you? You may or may not recognize this. These are notes from 303. And the only important thing here is to know that if you have a single tube, a pipe, for instance, and you have flow in that pipe, then the velocity distribution you'd expect to have in it would be something like this. It would be anchored at zero velocity at the walls of the pipe. It would be a maximum amount in the middle. And you could solve for that is by solving the differential equations. We don't really care about that here. But if you got the solution for that, the average flow through that pipe in cubic meters per second, so this is meters cubed per second, as a function of the fluid viscosity, a function of the pressure gradient, 
and as a function of the diameter, two times the radius is the diameter, which we'll work with, is this, right? So we know that in a single um, tube, we're able to get the magnitude of the flow rate, which is just this. So I just wanted to borrow that, and so let's go back here and do that. So flow in one tube is going to be whatever we had there. It's, I wrote it down. Is equal to pi times the diameter to the power 4 divided by 128 times the viscosity of the fluid that's flowing in it, water or whatever it is, and the change in pressure with length that occurs along our, our system. So that's the first thing we know. The other thing we need to know is, if we know what the diameter of these tubes are, we could say something about exactly uh, how this would uh, set ourselves up. So, but we don't know that very easily. So what we could do is, if we know the porosity of this system, which we'll use this term n, is just what? It's the volume of voids divided by the total volume. And in this particular case, what's the volume of voids? It's going to be this length. Uh, the volume of one of these tubes, if this diameter is d, then the volume of the voids is going to be the volume of one of these tubes multiplied by the number of tubes, right? So if you call the number of tubes i, not hydraulic gradient, which is sometimes used, so this is the number of tubes. I don't want to use n because we've used n. And the volume of each one of these tubes is going to be what? Pi d squared times L. So this is the total volume of all of the tubes that we have in here. And the total volume of this is going to be whatever this cross-sectional area is, which we'll call A, because we've used it before, times the length. So we get rid of that. So we have the porosity defined as the number of tubes multiplied by their diameters. And so what we want to know is the number of tubes, so we can just rewrite this in terms of the number of tubes, which is going to be I is equal to, um, sorry, I is going to be equal to the porosity uh, multiplied by the end area of the of this, this total end area, and divided by pi d squared. Right. And so now we can write total flow in porous medium. It's going to be what? If we call this q1, so Q total is just going to be Q1 times the number of tubes we have, right? Nothing more than that. And so we, if we write that out, we can take this value here, and we can take this value here, and if we write the product of them, we should have something that says porosity, area, pi, uh, the diameter squared, multiplied by pi d to the 4, just taking this top expression, 128 times the viscosity of the fluid, times dp dx. Right? And I think we get rid of a couple of things. Pi drops out. We have d squared and d to the 4. And so maybe we can rewrite that as something that looks like area, let's write 1 over viscosity, and let's write now um, d squared times porosity, diameter of the tube squared times porosity over 128. I think I missed out a 4 here, I believe. Is it when you were calculating the uh, porosity? Because the volume should be pi d squared by, by 4. By 4, yes. I knew this. The 4 is not there. So, yes, the volume of the voids is pi d squared upon 4. And so, yeah, that's exactly where it comes in. Thank you.
and it should be on the top as it turns out. So yeah, four, and this is four, and dpdx. And so this expression here, if we know that Darcy's law relates QT is equal to area times permeability over viscosity times dpdx, we have that exactly here. Area, dpdx, viscosity, and the only other term we have now defined is this. And so basically we can presume that this term represents the permeability. And so that's something uh, which is of utility to what you'll use in your assignment number two. So basically we can say that permeability we could get as the diameter of the pores space times porosity over 32, I think, is, is uh, 4 times 1 over 128. And so that's the, for those particular uh, expressions. You also see, for instance, uh, permeability defined alternatively, right? <coughs> so what that says is basically that permeability is proportional to the diameters of the pore uh, squared, if we could get them. Um, and nothing else in this particular case. And so we've made this, you've taken this expression on trust before, right? That the reasons for the capillary barriers working as capillary barriers is that permeability uh, is proportional to capillary diameter squared. You've just stated that. So now we've at least shown that that should, should be the case. What you would see with this is that if you wanted to flow things through here by having a pressure gradient between this upstream face and the downstream face, then certainly you could get it going in these pores, and that would be fine. If you had the pressure gradient acting in the opposite direction across it, then there'd be no flow in it whatsoever. And so the other kind of model that you could also apply to represent this, which I won't derive, but you could imagine uh, what the result would be. We'll just quote the result is if you had your porous medium and you idealize it as a whole bunch of pores going through in this way, but also a whole bunch of pores going from this face to the other face, to the other side of the board. And likewise, a whole bunch of pores going up and down through the system. So you have actually the, the tubes that you have, instead of being all in one direction, which we've assumed for this current model, which gives us this relationship here, we now have tubes in all three directions and then, of course, if you do that, you have to divide the porosity between those three different directions. And if you do that, then the permeability comes out as uh, porosity times the diameter squared divided by 96. It's just three times. Factor three comes in because you're dividing that porosity. Sorry, sorry. I was wondering, where did you get that 128 initially? Oh, it just comes from solving. It comes from this. It's if you solve the differential, the Navier-Stokes equations, if you remember those, uh, for these particular boundary conditions, um, the solution for that has this number in it. And so, so is just based on, like, the specific it's the pipe, pipe flow equation. And so actually you do know this, right? So if you remember back that, yeah, you remember this. So you kind of, you've seen it before because you know that the friction factor of a pipe is 64 over the Reynolds number. So 64 is just half of 128. So it's just a, it's a constant that comes out in the calculation. Okay. So it's it for the, the equation for flow in a pipe. So that's where it comes from. So you don't have to drive that, but it's useful to know that we can, in exactly the same way that we developed Capri models for displacement in, a, in a, a Capri tube, which represents the displacement process, we can use them to say something about the rates at which we flow th material through a system. And so that's, that's all I wanted to make the, the point with for that. Okay. So, okay. so how do we, so, so now in, in the same vein that when we introduce that for behavior in capillaries, we said that, well, it gives us some kind of scaling relationship, but it's actually not as useful as if we do an experiment on a porous medium and figure out exactly what this permeability would be just by measuring it. And so from 452, you should know what a permeability experiment looks like, but I guess we'll cover that again in this class as well. But now, did you talk about multi-phase flow, by the way, in 452?
at all. <coughs> In passing, too distant, can't remember. Okay. All right, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll do whatever we do. So the basic idea is this, is that we made this point that in a porous medium, if you invade it with something, then capillarity only works at the fringe of this, but inside this, it can flow just happily as its own, um, as if it's flowing fully saturated, in which case you can use Darcy's law in exactly the same way as I presume you'd have seen it in 452. And so what you could do is you could take this ganglion, which is the non-wetting fluid, which confusingly is the green fluid in this case, was the red fluid in the picture, and it's really going to have some kind of architecture that looks like this. It's not going to be continuous, it's going to have islands, it's going to have a, a boundary between where this is flowing and the other fluid. And if you can imagine putting this in, rearranging it in some way um, so that you can get it like this, maybe think about putting it in a centrifuge, not perhaps the best analog, so that you can put them all so that it's 100% napple here, the green stuff, and 100% water here then if you could do that, then what you could do is you could kind of apply Darcy's law to be able to look at the flow of the red fluid and separately look at the flow of the red, uh, blue, green fluid and between them say something about the flow of those two fluids together. And so that's what we're going to attempt to do. And what we're going to realize is that in the same way that, that we looked at invasion of um, a non-wetting fluid, the green fluid, and how that invasion changes the pore space, uh, we can look at the same behavior when we're talking about permeabilities. So if we change the saturation by invasion by adding more green non-wetting fluid to go from this case to this case to this case, then presumably the permeabilities of these three different systems would, would be different in some way. And we'd like to be able to quantify that. So that's our, our interest in being able to, to do that. So what we could do is if we centrifuge this down, so instead of having this, we have it in two very distinct components. Then we could look at doing an experiment to measure the permeability. And a typical permeability experiment is just to take a piece of core, not a capillary tube, um, flow some fluid from some kind of upstream reservoir into some downstream reservoir, um, where it has some height here, if it's under low pressure. It can just, you know, these different elevations will basically give you a difference in head across it, which is the same as a change in pressure, if you just divide that by a unit weight of one of the fluids, and be able to measure how much of these two fluids come out. If you measure how much of these two fluids come out over a given time, and you know what this pressure is that you've applied to it, then you can calculate this coefficient called permeability, or hydraulic conductivity. So that's basically the idea. And so if you think of this tube that has a porous medium in it, and you have the green fluid flowing in the top and the red fluid flowing in the bottom, then you can basically write Darcy's law, as we've done before, as this, where Q1 is a velocity, not a... F so, so before, what we said was that uh, uppercase Q was a volume flow rate, which is meters cubed per second. This is a velocity, which would be the volumetric flow rate divided by an area, which is equal to meters cubed per second divided by meters squared, which is just a velocity, right, by definition. And so Darcy's law is the velocity of this fluid coming out, and the velocity averaged, if you like, of the full area of flow. It's a Darcy velocity. I guess if you, to be precise, we should call it Darcy velocity because we will use that terminology. And it's a function of the permeability of this green porous medium to the viscosity of that fluid and the pressure drop that occurs across it from the upstream to the downstream portion. Right? This is the length and a pressure drop would occur from this face to this face and it would physically come out of this, this bottom side. So this is Darcy's law written for one of the phases. If you write it for the red phase, it would look like this. So it's, it's, it's no different. So this is a velocity. If we want to know what the volume that comes out from this would be, then the volume of fluid 1 would be equal to the velocity of fluid 1 multiplied by 
this cross-sectional area, the green cross-sectional area, and that would give us the amount. And so if we wanted to calculate the volumetric flow rate, then we would probably write something like the area 1, which is multiplied by k1. I'm just substituting this, this value in here. Uh, k1 over mu1, and the, the change in pressure over the length of flow. I guess L, just L, case L. And so this is what is, what is driving, driving flow. But when you do an experiment, then you typically don't really know, unless you look end on in the core, how much of the core is flowing green fluid and how much is flowing red fluid. And so when we do this calculation for flow rate, typically we want to know what the flow rate is relative to the total area of the end of the core, not just the area that's saturated with the green fluid. So if you multiply this equation by 1, then what we then have is a term here which looks like this. And so we could write this out that the volumetric flow rate of fluid 1 would be equal to the area, total area of the end of the core multiplied by this ratio, the saturated area of the green fluid divided by the total area, multiplied by the permeability times the viscosity times the, let's write it as a differential, dpdx, which is Darcy's law, of course, right? And so what comes out of this is the idea that now we have Darcy's law written in terms of a permeability uh, which we're going to assume, let's assume that this is just not the permeability of material <coughs> one, but just the permeability. It doesn't care that it has a different fluid in it. And we pre-multiply it by some term, which is basically, if we wanted to write this out, this second term is kind of, we've used this analog before, it's kind of the area of the, well, it's exactly the area of the green fluid to the total area of the green fluid and the red fluid. And if you like, if the porosity is uniform throughout it, that's basically the saturation. So, for instance, you could write this second term as the saturation of fluid 1 multiplied by permeability, multiplied by viscosity, and multiplied by the change in pressure with length. And so this term here is kind of... Um, an effective, sat an effective permeability, KEF, is an effective permeability. And what we've done is we've got this effective permeability. Uh, maybe we should take the, 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 the dynamic viscosity outside. But it's effective permeability that's multiplied by a saturation. And so... Uh, what the relative permeability is, is basically that. It's the effective permeability of the system. Yeah, let me take this actually outside. So it's there instead. Sorry about that. And so in other words, we're taking the true permeability, which would be the permeability if you've saturated the thing 100% with water or with methane or with oil. They would all give the same permeabilities. There's one value of permeability for a material not true for hydraulic conductivity, one value of permeability, and multiplied it by the saturation. <coughs> and it turns out that this saturation isn't exactly this value of relative permeability. The relative permeability to fluid 1 is actually typically less than the saturation of fluid 1. And so saturation 1 isn't actually a good necessarily a perfect indicator on it. But the basic idea is that because we calculate the flow out of this system over the total area of the, of the end of this core plug, then we're looking at the proportion of flow that comes out that is saturated by the green fluid, and therefore we can index these flows relative to the, the, the saturation. And so that index here is approximately equal to the saturation of fluid one but not exactly. And so the idea is that we can measure this relative permeability directly in an experiment, uh, 
and not be able to not have to make this assumption that it's equal to saturation. But if in the absence of a, a better uh, predictor, you could probably use the saturation to 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 index the relative permeability or the effective permeability. Right. So the only important expression that we've had so far from what we've talked about today is that we can define an effective permeability, which is the one we need, as a function of the intrinsic permeability of the material to one fluid at 100% saturation of that fluid. Doesn't matter what that fluid is, and we can multiply that by a number which varies between zero and one which just gives the relative permeability uh, to be able to give us the effective permeability. Okay? So that's the plan. If we... So, everyone okay with that? So maybe a bit convoluted, but that's the, an important first step. So relative permeability is an important feature. So maybe this... So in other words, what do we just say? So K effective is equal to K relative times k times k. This is an r. That's all. And that we think that this relative permeability is less than 1 and greater than 0. And kr is, approx is maybe, yeah, proportional might be a better term. Not approximately equal to, but proportional to saturation of whatever that fluid is. Okay? So that's permeability magnitudes. So how do we use that? Well, you might have seen permeability or hydraulic conductivity in a slightly different way. Um, but for most of <coughs> so you can use permeability to calculate volumetric flow rates through systems. And you can do it either as a function of pressure gradients or heads, hydraulic heads. So there's often a lot of confusion related to those. Uh, I think it's easier for the things that you're doing to use heads because it's, it's to me it's more intuitive. But the confusion is basically this. It's the, the swimming pool analog, right? So if you sit in a swimming pool... Uh, so if you look at Darcy's law and you take the way that we usually da write Darcy's law, that says that the flow velocity is equal to permeability, viscosity, let's just do it for one phase, times the pressure change with location. So this says that there's a velocity that you get in the system that occurs if you have a finite pressure gradient, so long as there's a finite permeability. And permeability is always finite. So the implications of that would be that if you take a swimming pool and if you look at the, the, the water pressure in that swimming pool, how does water pressure change with time, with uh, location? Well, you know that if you go down in the swimming pool, the pressure change is going to be pressure is equal to unit weight of the fluid times the elevation. So that's exactly what this curve is. Go deeper in a swimming pool, your ears feel more pressure. You've also looked at this expression, and you've probably seen it look like this. And you know from looking at this is what? Is minus unit weight of water. So you know that the pressure gradient is constant as you're going down, and it's the gradient in the z direction. So what this would suggest is that if you look at the flow rate, the velocity of flow that you get by applying um, a pressure gradient in the z direction, that this is flowing, right? There's a pressure gradient in this swimming pool. It's positive. It's, it, it, there's a pressure gradient, positive, negative, doesn't matter, in the vertical direction. And so Darcy's law would say that there should be a net flow in this system. If it's a swimming pool, fine. If you fill a swimming pool with, with sand and have fluid in it, you still have this pressure distribution. And it's saying that you should have some circulation of fluid. But you don't. It's, it's stagnant. It's static. And the reason for that is that if you want to look at flow in the system, you have to subtract off this pressure gradient. And so, in other words, the, the gradient that would be causing flow would be the gradient in excess of this hydrostatic gradient. And so you have to take this, this component off. And so if you write Darcy's law in its true form, you write it just like this. <coughs> 
you write it in terms of a velocity as a function of permeability and viscosity, a pressure gradient, which is how we would think of writing it. But you have to have this other term present here. And this other term is the unit weight of the water, gamma w, and multiplied by a constant. And a constant that relates to the coordinate system you take. If this direction here, xj, is in the horizontal direction, then the horizontal direction is perpendicular to the z direction. And the, the, these two vectors, if you like, are orthogonal to each other. So this term is equal to 0, and this term drops out. And this really is the, the true value. If it's in the other horizontal direction, the y direction, then again they're orthogonal to each other, and this term here is 0. But if the flow direction is in the vertical direction, the same direction that gravity acts in, then the components of these in that direction are either either they're collinear, in which case they're equal to 1, or they're antilinear, if you like, and they're equal to minus 1. It doesn't matter which one it is. And this term is equal to 1, and you end up with a, an extra term on here, which is just the unit weight of the, the fluid. Right? So that's why looking at pressures is a little um, confusing, and perhaps I make it more confusing. But the bottom line is that intuitively you know that the pressure gradient in a swimming pool is not zero, but the flow velocity in a swimming pool is zero, so there has to be some extra term to compensate from this, and it's basically this term. So you won't need to use these, but you need to understand this concept to be able to make the, the connection between flow in porous media where there's a pressure defining flow and flow in porous media where there's um, a hydraulic gradient defining flow. So here's the way to link them. If you think of a swimming pool as equal to this, and if you define uh, Bernoulli's equation, right? You recall Bernoulli's equation allows us to define head as equal to pressure divided by unit weight, uh, the elevation head, plus this other term, velocity head, v squared over 2g. In all groundwater flow, the velocities are smaller. We just throw it away. But you end up with this, these two remaining terms. These two remaining terms, basically, this is the elevation that you find yourself at. And this is the pressure change that occurs as you move within the fluid, as you go up, up or down the fluid. So you can write the head in this way. If you, for instance, throw this value of head into uh, Darcy's law, for instance, if you write Darcy's law as Q is equal to permeability divided by viscosity, um, instead of pressure, you look at change in location relative to pressure. And you write pressure as being equal to um, h gamma w. Then you end up basically with being able to get this form of the expression. right? So you just substitute this in for pressure is equal to h gamma w. Now you have head present within here, and so if you write that out in longhand, you basically have this. You'd have what? Let me write it in longhand. You'd have Q is equal to K over mu. If we take this term here and write it out, it's rho G, which is this, uh, multiplied by dH dx. And of course, you realize uh, that this term here is exactly the same. Uh, I'm running out of space, but you could also write this as hydraulic dh dx. So this is hydraulic conductivity. Uh, someone drew up on the board last time that k over rho g is hydraulic conductivity divided by the unit weight of the fluid is equal to permeability divided by viscosity. And that's exactly what you have here. This term here, although I've just kind of jumped between, basically used this to do that, 
allows you to write the difference in velocities between these two systems. So, the summary. Only point is, you can use hydraulic heads or you can use pressures to be able to calculate rates of flow of fluids in these systems. Uh, they're entirely equivalent because they're the same system. The reason that pressures gets a little complicated is because this kind of this swimming pool effect that you have to, if you're looking at migration in the vertical direction, you have to account for the fact that pressure changes with depth, even though there's no net excess pressure gradient which is causing flow. And so if you're, you're dealing with these things, probably the easiest way for you to solve any of the problems that we talk about in this class, I think, is to work in terms of hydraulic heads um, uh, and, and use those to define volumetric flow rates. So, so hopefully I haven't uh, completely confused you beyond all recognition. So, so, anyway. so think about that. If it doesn't make sense now, ask now. If it doesn't make sense by next time, then ask a question um, and we'll deal with it. So, so that gives us some idea of how to be able to calculate the flow velocities. So this, as we've said, is a flow velocity. If we want to, we can also get volumetric flows, which are just equal to the flow velocity of fluid 1 multiplied by the total cross-sectional area of the specimen. That would be, so the amount of um, petroleum that we're producing per unit time is the amount that we would calculate from this expression, actually from this expression here, multiplied by the uh, area of the core, not just the saturated part. And so it allows us to be able to calculate the amount of fluid very simplistically that we'll get through the system. And I'd be happy to do an example. Maybe we'll start off next time once you've digested this with an example. The net result of this is that if we want to be able to define the, the, the flow the volumetric flow rate of fluid 1 through the system, we can do it by the total area of the core, the relative permeability to that fluid multiplied by the permeability and the pressure change with length. If we want to know what the volumetric flow rate of fluid 2 is, we again use the total area of the core, end of the core, we use the relative permeability of fluid 2, the permeability of the core, and the pressure gradient along its length. We can use the viscosities of each of these fluids. But the point, the important point here is that the permeability is unique to the rock or the aquifer. And so if it's 100% filled with uh, water, so KH2O is exactly the same as K methane, even though it's a gas, which is exactly the same as to uh, gasoline. Uh, because they all assume that they're 100% saturated with that fluid, right? <coughs> and so if you want to measure the permeabilities of core, you saturate with one fluid, you measure the flow rate that develops as you apply a pressure difference between the upstream and downstream, you measure how much flows into a bucket over a given time, and you have enough here to be able to calculate it, because if it's 100% saturated, this term is always equal to 1, you know the viscosity of the fluid, you know the pressure gradient you apply, you measure the flow rate in a bucket, how it accumulates, you know the area of the core, and the only thing you have left to calculate is this, so you know it. But what this allows you to do is if you knew something about what these relative permeabilities were, then it would allow you to say something about how much of each of these fluids come out, and they'll come out in mixed form. Um, for most of the time. So in other words, if you have it partially saturated with the red fluid and the green fluid, you apply a gradient across the end of it, then both of those fluids will come out of the end, and so it has some transmission to each of those fluids. 
And so what we can use is we can use this relative permeability uh, curve to describe the behavior. And what you'll see here is it has two ordinates. It has a saturation of water on the bottom, no water, 100% filled with water. And it has the vertical ordinate is uh, between 0 and 1. So these are relative permeabilities. So it would be the relative permeability of fluid 1 and the relative permeability of fluid 2. And as we said before, these kind of scale with the saturations you'd expect. Um, I suppose if you thought they scaled the saturations, then you'd think that the relative permeability curves, well, I'll draw that in a second, but let me explain it. So what these curves represent is that if you have the pore space filled mainly with this green non-wetting fluid, then this means that maybe you're 90% non-wetting and 10% wetting. So this means that on this graph you'd be roughly here. And if you measured the relative permeabilities to each of these fluids, then you could do that by doing this experiment, and you'd have some term in this. It happens to be a blank area, so let's not do that for now. If you keep on uh, pumping the red fluid in it, which is the wetting fluid, actually it will spontaneously imbibe, so that you increase the, the, the red fluid at the expense of the green fluid. If you put more red fluid in, the green fluid has to come out to compensate. So now maybe we are 30% red and 60% green. So 30% water would be, say, here. And if we measure the relative permeability of the um, red fluid, the water, that is our magnitude here. Um, no, sorry, the green fluid. So the relative permeability of the green fluid is this magnitude here. If you think about this a minute before, a moment before this invasion became all the way across here. So what we're having to do here is actually we're putting in red fluid. So the red fluid now allows the connection between the upstream level here and the downstream level here to be complete, right? So it's actually a complete pathway from the upstream to the downstream. So here, the, the relative permeability to the red fluid would be zero, right? You're, you've got a pressure gradient. There's no connection between the upstream and the downstream. And therefore, the relative permeability of that fluid has to be zero. It has to be down here. As you increase the red fluid, well, it's still not made a connection, still not made a connection, still not made a connection, just made a connection. Now we keep on pumping more red fluid in. It increases the saturation of the red fluid. Now there's much more cross-sectional area, which is red on this downstream side than it was before. And so when we're 60% red and, um, yeah, 60%, 40% red and 60%, the red fluid is a wetting fluid. 60% wetting fluid, 40% uh, non-wetting fluid, we're at this point here, say. And when we're at this point here, uh, just for kicks, let's take this point here. Let's say we're 50-50. So we're at 50% of each of the fluids, but the relative rel effective permeability of the red fluid is this, which is not very big, right? It's probably about 0.2. And the relative permeability of the green fluid just happens to be the same. Uh, it's this curve here which is 0.2 as well, so they're both equal. And so even though the saturations of these will have to add up to 100%, it's 20% of the permeability is in one fluid, 20% of the permeability is in the other fluid. If you add those two together, that's what this curve is here. And 60% of the permeability is missing, it doesn't exist. And so it's much less efficient at pushing fluids through it when it's mixed because it's got all these torturous flow paths. So we keep on putting more water in it, the red fluid, and at some stage we put so much water in it that there's now no longer a connection of the green fluid between upstream and downstream. And so that's the point where we've increased the red fluid. We've gone from here, somewhere across the bottom, to this point here. The relative permeability to water is increased, so now it's about 0 0.4, 0 0.45. But now the relative permeability to the green fluid is zero because it's pinched off. 
and there's no, no connection between the upstream and the downstream. And so this is basically the essence of relative permeability. And really what it does is it says as a function of the saturation of water exactly what you think the value of this multiplier, this indexing multiplier would be at any particular saturation. And I think somewhere we have it written down um, uh, here, I think, right? That this relative permeability is a function of saturation. And I, I guess I was going to do something which I didn't do. We also made the, the case, and, and it's actually written here, uh, one, that permeability, if it's 100% saturated, is one value. It's a Darcy, or a micro Darcy, or a milli Darcy, or if it's a shale, it's a nano Darcy, 10 to the minus uh, 9 Darcy's, or 10 to the minus 21 meters square. Uh, but we also said that this relative permeability um, is proportional to saturation from the argument that we had, basically because it's the proportion of this, the face that we have that's saturated with one fluid, which is kind of the relative permeability. That was the expression that we had here, that this relative permeability is essentially, could be similar to the relative permeability. It turns out that it isn't, because these are real curves for real rocks. And of course, if the effective permeability was directly proportional to uh, saturation, then it, it would look like this. It would be this X plot. Right? So this is just joining the top left corner. So this would be, uh, this is just the saturation of water. Saturation of water here is zero. Saturation of water here is 20%. So this is 20%. Saturation of water here is 100%. So this is just plotting saturation on the vertical axis between 0 and 1. So if you plotted saturation vertically as a proxy for relative permeability, it would look like this so-called x-plot. And of course, the real uh, relative permeability to water in this particular case is the pathway that I'm taking here. And it would actually kind of go up like this. And maybe it does this up here. So it's getting crowded, but we'll see this. So this would be the relative permeability due to the wetting fluid in this particular case. If we look at the saturation of the non-wetting fluid, uh, here there's zero water, but there's 100% non-wetting fluid, and therefore this one is represents that. Here at this point, there's zero non-wetting fluid, and so this, this ordinate would be here. You join them up, and you get a straight line. And so the rel perm curve might look like this. It follows this green line down here, and then goes out here. And I suppose it's getting too busy, but you can go and look at the video, right? Uh, relative perm of the non-wetting fluid is this, this trajectory here. And so I guess we see a couple of things. One is that the saturation isn't really a very good proxy for relative permeability, but it's not terrible either, right? It's not horrendous. Um, and if we didn't have um, a, cap uh, a relative permeability curve, then um, using saturation might, might work for us. So that's kind of the, the explanation for relative permeabilities. Um, we've said most of the things, I've made the points of most of the things here, um, and, well, actually just to tie things together before we uh, part, let me do one other thing. And that is, we can tie together mainly, so, so the, the whole exercise of what we talked about in terms of these Capri models for permeability and pore diameters was that the behavior, capillary behavior and invasion in pore spaces is related to permeability, which governs the rate at which you can push fluids through the system. So this isn't completely random, but if you take this plot that we now have for relative permeabilities, and if we take the plot we have for invasion, then we have two plots. I'm just going to draw two graphs on top of each other. 
and they're both these kind of crucial graphs that we've already seen. They both have the same horizontal axis. I'm sure I won't draw them very nicely, but you'll understand where we're going here. This is saturation of water, which varies from 0 to 1, or 0 to 100%. Exactly the same on this other plot here. And if I can do it, I'm going to draw two exclusion zones at the left-hand side and at the right-hand side. And so this is everything you need to have known so far from this class <coughs> is embodied on this plot. And this is, these are relative permeabilities, rel perms. The axis of this is between 0 and 1. And this is uh, actually, it could be capillary pressures, but let's do it as capillary pressures divided by the interfacial tension and divided by permeability over porosity, right? Our so called J function, which scales with capillary pressure. And so we know if we fill these in, the curves will look like. Again, I'm sure I won't draw this very well, but maybe I can draw it well enough. I could put an arrow on there, I guess, for going up and going down. And in terms of our relative permeability curves, look like I've got something wrong with me. Fortunately, I don't, although you don't believe that, do you? Yeah, so, that's, so this is um, relative permeability of non-wetting, which would be this one. And this would be the relative permeability of the wetting. And if I just close out by putting the important ordinates on this, this is the irreducible non-wetting saturation. Bless you. This is the irreducible wetting saturation. This is what we've called PC0, right? The bubbling pressure. This would be a imbibition curve. This would be a drainage curve. And drainage because it's you're draining out um, No, they're backwards, right? This is uh, this is draining water. So Yes, okay, I'm an idiot today. I'm always an idiot. And this is ambition, sorry, so these are wrong. And we have a whole bunch of scanning curves between. Them. So that's basically the crux of what we're doing with it. And if you want, I, I won't uh, draw it on because I don't really have time. Uh, this all also revolves around this idea that if you look at these changes in saturation as you go across, this is physically what's driving this. Um, there's these exclusion zones at the end because it's not connected from one side to the other, and so there can be no flow. And so there's a very obvious physical reason why these curves exist, and that's something that you should, uh, I think is the most important thing to, to get into your mind about what we're doing now. So it's re really quite straightforward. Okay? Great. Any questions? Great. All right, we're done. Thank you.